welcome to EWTN's coverage of the 14th Ordinary Synod of Bishops. This is day two of the Synod focusing on the family and things are already getting interesting. Today with me in studio is Michael Kelly. Michael is the editor of the Irish Catholic newspaper, Ireland's largest and best-selling religious newspaper. Michael, welcome to the program. Very thanks, always great to be in Rome. Today at 1 p.m., as always happens, there was a press briefing in the Holy See Press Office with Father Lombardi and a few of the Synod Fathers. Uh, what struck you about that conference? Because la yesterday's, let's say, was a bit mechanical, a bit flat, and today was so interesting. But what struck you? Well, Father Lombardi was really at pains to point out yesterday to the journalists, this is the first day, so calm down, not a lot is happening. It's very clear now that a lot more is happening. The Synod Fathers are starting to make their interventions. So we're getting these syntheses of what the, what the Synod Fathers are saying. One of the things that struck me was uh, Pope Francis uh, came back to the Synod today. He addressed the Synod Fathers, and he made it very clear. I I think maybe to calm some fears that people have. Church doctrine around marriage isn't changing, it doesn't change, but this is about uh, seeing what kind of language we can have to be in dialogue with people around these issues, these really important issues that are facing the church. So to hear the synthesis of what the Synod Fathers are saying and to have Synod Fathers there to uh, discuss the, the challenges, the issues, the discussions that are really going on in that spirit of journeying together. I like the fact that Pope Francis came back. This is not what is usually done, but of course, this isn't a usual synod. Neither was last year's extraordinary synod. So uh, I like the fact that he was there. He may be there tomorrow. We don't know. Uh, somebody asked today if he might be involved in the small discussion groups. Father Lombardi said, he could be. If he wants to be, of course he's welcome. This is a Pope of surprises. <laughs> this is a Pope of surprises for sure. Um, one of the most, uh, what things that struck me, two new things I thought came out that I thought were very newsworthy. First, as they deal with the problems of uh, Christian marriages, let's say, that are failing, that are in trouble, the amount of annulments that are having to take place in divorce uh, among Catholic couples. Something that they came up with was a new catechesis for marriage. This is an idea that's just being floated. So already on day one, the Synod Fathers are floating this idea of coming up with a new catechesis for marriage. This is to help prepare the couples mm. before they get married and then also afterwards. And there's a big emphasis on that now. We have to accompany the couples after they get married as well because families are splintered. Community is not what it was. Uh, the priests as well, didn't they? They spoke of the sure. priests having to be prepared uh, to accompany these families in a special way. Very much so. And this is something that I think the church is reflecting very deeply about, that marriage is not a moment in time. Marriage is not the ceremony. Marriage is a lifelong commitment, and that's something that we have to allow couples to uh, have the space to prepare for and to discuss the issues that are going to be really part of marriage because the... Um, a generation ago, perhaps, we could have assumed that Catholic couples shared the church's vision of marriage. Well, you know what? Catholic couples nowadays, they're subject to the same cultural influences as other places. So we now have to say, look, this is the church's understanding of marriage. Journey with us in this understanding, and not just before getting married, also after getting married, in those few key early years, when those challenges come up, uh, financial challenges, all kinds of practical challenges, because that's one of the things that's interesting about this synod as well. They're talking about a lot of the practical challenges. Family and marriage has been under in a really practical way, as well as the theological insights, of course, that we're getting. We're getting these really practical insights about the challenges facing young couples and what the church can do to help them. This is one of the problems that the Synod Fathers will be tackling. The other one I thought was that was interesting is an initiative for the Jubilee of Mercy, which we know is beginning December 8th. They brought up the idea that the Synod Fathers had discussed the possibility of reinstating what is kind of known as the third way of confession. Mm. And this is general absolution, which means you don't confess your sins individually to the priest. You, as a group, can be absolved. And this was originally instituted for soldiers going to war, so they could be generally absolved before they head off to battle. Sure. They're talking about bringing that back. This is something new. Absolutely. You know very well that for Pope Francis, mercy is a key dynamic of his papacy. That line, you know, in his first week as Pope, he said, God never tires of forgiving us it is we who tire of asking for his forgiveness. You know what, I think some of the Synod Fathers have a sense that there may be some people because of their past lives, because of sins in their lives, they feel that they're not worthy of God's forgiveness. They may feel that they're not welcome at the sacrament of confession as it is. Now, of course, that's not true. Everyone is always welcome at the sacrament right. of confession. But at a psychological level, this third way perhaps is something that some of the Synod Fathers feel could help some of those people, could help restore them to the church, restore them to the community so that they could get back on an even keel and get back to going to confession in the 
conventional sense, but just this, this one moment, perhaps during the year of mercy, this one general right. absolution could clear up so much for them, so much hurt, so much heartache, so much feeling of alienation. It's so interesting to hear already on day one so many new ideas coming out from the Synod Fathers, which again are from all over the world. One of the uh, presenters at the press conference today, who I thought I had a lot of interesting things to say, was Archbishop de Rocher. He is the president of the Canadian Bishops Conference. Yeah, I thought he was one of the most powerful mm -hmm. speakers. Um, what I wanted to do is play a clip for you right now of something he said during the press conference. Let's listen to that together, and I want to get your reaction. My mission to the bishops is uh, there is a great unanimity in recognizing that there is a growing distance between the cultural vision of marriage and family life and what the church proposes and teaches um, growing out of the teaching of Jesus. And that growing gulf um, involves, I guess, um, different ways of uh, reaction. Uh, and one reaction is to emphasize what the, the teaching is for fear that as the culture moves away from that vision, our own understanding gets diluted. Uh, the other fear is that we lose contact with that culture and that we close in on ourselves and become a kind of a, a ghetto or a sect that no longer has an impact no. in culture. And all the bishops, I think, agree that the teaching of the church coming from Jesus is a gift for the world. It's not just for a select few. Michael, he brought up that kind of two-sided coin of presenting the truth of the church's message, um, but also risking alienating the culture of which we're trying to dialogue with. What do you make of those remarks? That's the challenge, isn't it? I think he's captured the key challenge that a lot of the Synod Fathers are saying, both publicly and privately. This idea that all of the Synod Fathers, the starting point here is to uphold the church's beautiful exactly. teaching around yeah. marriage and human sexuality. but. A large part of the world is deaf to that. And how do we enter into dialogue with those people? How do we find a way to present the church's teaching? And not just as an ideal, present it as something that we think is achievable, present it to a world that is maybe got many other influences that sometimes is, is deaf to that message. And I think that really is the challenge, whether it's around finding language, whether it's around finding points of dialogue, points of agreement and moving out from those points of agreement. But I think the Archbishop really has captured one of the key, one of the key things that all of the Synod Fathers here are grappling with how do we stay faithful to the church's teaching and still be able to invite people to be able to exactly. enter into dialogue with people. Engage that culture. Uh, the next clip I wanted to play for you uh, is the, some of the problems that the bishops are having during the synod is that they want the same things, but their way of getting there is very different. And so I think that sometimes results in problems or what seems like disagreements. Let's listen to how Archbishop de Rocher put it today during today's press conference. The bishops will emphasize the teaching and others will emphasize no. the importance of the dialogue. And I think that's why it's important that this is a collegial uh, exercise. In the sense we do this together because we need to hold both of those together. I think Cardinal Erdo's talk was a, a beautiful and classical presentation of the church's teaching. And I think that there are other bishops who are saying this is important, we need to hold on to this, now, how do we enter into dialogue with this world? I think that's the problem facing the bishops worldwide. We know that 72 stood up today and gave their addresses, again, representing every continent, as Father Lombardi pointed mm. out during the press conference. Um, this is the problem. Universally, how do we engage? And I think that's what they're here to discuss because the secularism has taken over. So many families are being ripped apart, and the synod is about the family. I think that's why Pope Francis called the extraordinary mm. synod on the family. We've only had three in the church's history. Uh, he sees the problems facing the keeping families together and secularism and how that is really taking a toll on family life. Because secularism at its heart when it comes to family, it no longer believes what we believe around the family, that it should be it should be faithful, it should be permanent. And I think what the Archbishop is really articulating is there are two distinct hermeneutics going on at this synod. I think at one level you have a hermeneutic of reading the gospel in the light of the world. At another level I think you have the hermeneutic of reading the world in the light of the gospel. Now we obviously believe that the gospel has something to say not only to Catholics we believe what we have to say 
say about marriage and family life, that that is good for the wider culture. We have this idea within Catholicism of the common good. So we're not just presenting these things for Catholics, but again, how we get these things outside of the church and how we get to say to the wider society, these are really the goods. I suspect in a certain sense, we need a kind of via media. The, um, the gospel obviously is the light of the world, but at the same time, Christ said to his followers that they must be able to read the signs of the time. I think that's a tension that we're seeing in the synod between those two distinct hermeneutics. What do you think about this new way of, of, of doing synod? Because you've covered synods in the past, I have as well. I've been inside a, an entire synod once mm. because as a full-time journalist at the time for Vatican Radio, uh, they, and only they, were allowed in behind the closed door sessions. And it was a lot of just standing up, you gave your speech, you sat down. So there are criticisms, there's some good and some bad, maybe to way uh, that Pope Francis has organized this, maybe a little confusion, I think sure. that's what we hear sometimes. Um, but what do you think of this new way of synod? There's certainly quite a lot of confusion. Uh, no one likes change, and it's particularly right. for synod fathers who have been here many times before. Uh, they're finding that a little bit difficult. I was talking to today one synod father. This is his first time at a synod of bishops, so it's all new to him. It's all novel to him. For a lot of them, right? They said a lot of them are novices. This is their first synod. Quite a lot, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the key thing is this is not set in stone. I think we're going to have to look at this process afterwards. What were the weaknesses? What were the strengths? This is novel. What were what didn't work and I think again that is Pope Francis's whole air idea of discernment around the synod yeah. process that it shouldn't be set in stone inevitably methodology you know that it came up at the briefing today that some people have been questioning the methodology I know at this morning synod uh, the Holy Father himself clarified some of the methodology because he himself of course has uh, as, as, as presider he himself has approved all of this methodology I think it's probably something we're going to have to come back to in many ways the we've only had synods from the 1970s which is a very short period in church history so they really are in need of further development and I think we'll see that in coming years. Definitely and uh, even one of the, at the press conference today they said you know basically and they said this is something we're trying and if it doesn't work but it said that it's something that all the synod fathers agreed on it's not something that was imposed upon them but I, I did a chuckle of it. at the beginning of the press conference they said most of the questions in the morning were clarifications from synod fathers about now, now, how do the small groups work? Sure. How is this going to go on? So uh, I think it's interesting. But I think we're off to a good start. They know what's going to take place now. They know the structure. And we've already got some great discussion going on about things that are going to help improve family life. I think it's... For sure, and we're seeing the different challenges in different parts of the world. What's an issue in North America or Western Europe is not an issue in Southeast Asia or West Africa. And it's really important to get that universality of the church that all of these issues feed into the debate and discussion. That issue came up today of the idea of, uh, of regional conferences. Right. I think that's something important as well because we have yeah. such an enormous universal church. And it's good for all the Sindhi fathers to hear their problems from all over the world as they try to address these issues. Uh, Michael Kelly, the editor of the Irish Catholic Ireland's largest and best-selling religious newspaper. Thank you so much for being with us. Stay tuned. There's a lot more synod coverage, synod coverage ahead. We'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back to EWTN News' continuing coverage of the Synod on the Family. Our next guest is Father Stephen Fawcett. He was a secretary during the last Synod. And Father, you were inside behind the closed doors. You witnessed the small discussion groups. You witnessed everything. everything. I wanted to ask you specifically about the small discussion groups because we're out here. They play a large role this year. What are they like and did, did the discussions get heated? What are these things go like that go on? No, I think they're a great format. Um, I mean, it was inspiring to be part of the whole synod when you've got uh, 182 fathers giving different perspectives right. from around the world. But then the nitty gritty happens in the smaller groups when you've got about 20, um, in, in our case, English speaking um, synod fathers. You had a married couple from Iraq, a married couple from America. You got a Baptist uh, African minister. So th th there's lots of uh, diversity. And it's, as was said earlier, it's a, it's a great reminder that the problems of one person's country are very different to another. Um, I have to say that there wasn't there wasn't tension in that sense. There, there was, I think, sometimes when we look with the eyes of faith, we we want drama. When we look with the eyes of uh, faith, 
Sorry, we we see dynamism, and that's right, what I, that's right. what I'd say. Yeah, we got we got dynamism. You have a lot of dynamism, not we did, that conflict, we did. and and just different views of opinion. It doesn't mean that they're in conflict with no, one not another. Not at all, and that's, yeah, that's the danger. So I think yeah. what we're looking for always is complementarity rather than conflict, uh, and it's it's more dramatic, yeah. you know, to be a sort of a Jeremy Kyle and look for conflict. But how how long do they talk? How long do these things go on? So they sit around a table. How long does that go on? Um, normally, it's two, two 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 and a half hours in the morning, wow. and similarly in the afternoon. And I'm going to have a break in the middle. Um, um, you know, there's always refreshments going on. Um, but as I said, it was, you know, it was a great perspective of, of just... Uh, I have to say as well that um, we were next door to the Italian group uh, and the walls weren't that thick. And perhaps <laughs> just the nature of the Italians, right. like, they were a little bit more uh, animated than, than we were. Um, me personally, I also think they were a bit handicapped. I think it was a fantastic first week. It was so full of joy, so full of dialogue, so full of listening and people just wanting what was best. And, and I, I have to say, in all honesty, I don't think the draft document did any favours. And so I think, right. I think something was lost because for three and a half days of, of uh, small groups, a lot of them had to sort of recapture what they felt had been lost by that document rather than being able to uh, go forward. And that's why I think it's a, it's a great uh, decision by uh, the Secretariat to, to, to just see this three weeks as a, as a continuation. I think it, it wouldn't have helped to have another start. As I said, to have 182 people giving a, a perspective from different countries was wonderful. But it meant you had 182 starts. And right. so, that to, so development, you couldn't really do in that first week. So build on it. Let's not so start again. So we don't need to start again. So, so what do you think about the changes um, to this year's sit no, like, group? So there's been some changes made, and, and what do you think of them? Yeah, I, I, as I said, I, I'd say it's just a natural continuity. I, yeah. I, I don't think necessarily it's, it's because, oh, it went wrong and we need to change. I, I honestly yeah. think we had a great start, but there's no point restarting. Um, and they also had a great thing in the draft document of three sections of, of, of listening so that it's... Um, it, that, that's about what the reality is now here for our people uh, of looking that was primarily looking at the face of Christ and, and then trying to as I said find the complementarity I mean we as I said the world talks about synthesizing and uh, clashing but I mean we're trying to see it's the same Christ the Christ is in the midst of the family is in the Christ is in the midst of the church mm. let's try and see the face of Christ uh, in those both dimensions. Uh, is it overwhelming to kind of see all of that happen in the collegiality? Because it was, mate. I, was I, I think of them as apostles, Christ's apostles, no, as brother bishops, and when you see them all gathered there, there's something spi very I, spiritual I was happening. sitting there thinking, apart from Vatican II, apart from ecumenical councils, this is magisterium I in action. And it was, it was amazing. And, it, um, you know, the, the, the 180 fathers, or 350 this year, they're not there because of 350 cleverest people in the church. I, I mean, I'm not saying they are, I'm not saying they're not. <laughs> they're there because they're pastors, pastors because they're yes. wise and they have the care of their people and, and they're able to articulate that. And they have a breadth of experience that is just extraordinary. And that's why you, you just see the Holy Spirit uh, in action. I, I, I just think it's yes. such a joyful event. And we, I, I didn't have much time to um, look at media during those two weeks. It was very busy. Good. Um, <laughs> well, exactly. And I did not recognize the Synod. In, in, the in the media synod. Uh, did did it, any of the synod fathers, did they have the same critique? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. There was a lot of spin, it maybe. It was yeah. so relaxed, it was so joyful. Mm. The Holy Father started off by saying, um, you know, if you believe in synodality, you've got to say what you feel inspired to say. Don't worry if Pope Francis agrees with you or not, you know, right. and obviously you've got to laugh at that, but it really, it really set the scene, and I think he's done the same. He has said nothing about any individual item. What he said is, let's get the process right. right. And we all play our own part. And he said it's anchored in the Holy Spirit and, and mm. himself. And he's, he's, he's happy to play his part. What do you think about him showing up even on day two? Well, it's so typical about it, it's isn't it? It's right, you know? isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> he probably drove over in his Fiat <laughs> on the way. Up. But you know, I thought it was great of him to be there with his brother bishops because he does insist on being one of them. Yeah. A very. Uh, he talks about getting your hands dirty, brethren, and, and that's it, what he does with himself. The sheep. I know somebody <laughs> said, "Well, will he be at the the small groups?" And they're like, "Probably." I mean, they don't know. I love it how even the 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 people in charge are like, "We don't know. Don't he know. could show up at any time." And isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Father, thank you so much. It's Father Fawcett talking, from the Archdiocese of Birmingham in the UK, who was a secretary during last year's synod. Thank you so much for joining us. Now I want to turn to an interview that our EWTN Rome Bureau Chief Alan Holdren did recently with Bishop Conley from Lincoln, Nebraska. He spoke with him about his expectations for the Synod. Let's listen. Your Excellency, the Synod is just beginning here in Rome. Uh, you're looking on the Synod as an, as an outsider. You're not one of the Synod Fathers, but you are a bishop. And you're particularly interested in this, I'm sure, as the head of a diocese. 
What are your expectations for the Synod on the Family? My hope is that the Synod will, um, the Synod Fathers will, and the Holy Father together will uh, be able to um, present the church's teaching uh, in a, a very clear, beautiful way with new enthusiasm, new impulse, new, you might say, um, kind of like the new evangelization, you know, not changing anything because we have such a beautiful teaching on the family, whether we talk about marriage or family life. Um, to, to present that again with, uh, with, um, with all the beauty and the splendor and the truth that our teaching has uh, without you know, minimizing the tremendous challenges and difficulties that families face today through secularism and through the sexual revolution and all the other things that fall from that, divorce, abortion, contraception, all those issues which I think go to the heart of uh, the, the challenges of the family today. But because the truth of the family, as it's been presented in church teaching and through scripture and re revelation, um, we don't need to change that. You know, there's no contradiction with regard to mercy and pastoral ministry and the truth of Catholic doctrine. And looking on at the last installment of the Synod uh, from Lincoln, Nebraska, hearing what was coming from Rome, do you feel like that, that narrative, those ideas of, of protecting uh, Catholic doctrine, the family, uh, promoting the family as uh, a positive thing in this world. Do you think that was done through the last installment of the Synod? Or is that something that uh, perhaps wasn't transmitted to the faithful? I mean, you're talking about last fall? Yeah. I think that the Extraordinary Synod, um, and perhaps this was good, that um, you know, raised a lot of the questions that, uh, and the challenges uh, and, and laid them all out on the table. And, um, but I hope that this synod will present the church's teaching um, with a real positive light. I mean, our teaching is not a series of no's, it's a, it's a series of yeses. Yeses to the beauty of God's gift of love, the beauty of spousal uh, self-giving in family, uh, the beauty of children and the gift of children. So I, I hope, my hope is, and I know my people as well, because when we made our presentation uh, from the Diocese of Lincoln, we listened to families, what they expect, what they want from the Synod. And that's what I presented to the Holy See and, and as far as our contribution, is that we would like to see the church's teaching presented because it's the only antidote out of this mess that we're in. Uh, we have the truth. We have the fullness of revelation and the church's teaching on marriage and family and sexuality and all the other things that go with that. We need to present it with confidence, with joy, um, and with absolute clarity. And that's what my people want, and that's what they told me. You were, you were speaking about the questionnaires that were sent out by the, uh, by the Vatican uh, so that they could best respond to the issues that families face today. Correct. What, what was the contents of that questionnaire for people who may not know that this was asked? Of them? Well, there were a series of questions that we were, all the bishops throughout the world were asked to take to our people. Um, and they had to do with all the different issues surrounding marriage and family, human sexuality. And to, um, they wanted to hear from us. And so we went through um, a series of presenting these at different levels throughout the diocese to get feedback from the faithful, the lay faithful, the priests, the different uh, department heads that uh, work in marriage and family, marriage preparation. And <clears throat> they basically were uh, asking questions about how can we do a better job in reaching out to people in these all these areas, and uh, and so that's what we presented, and we listened and heard from many people, and we uh, presented those uh, those answers to the Holy See with the hope that this would help them in formulating, you might say, the schema, you know, of what the uh, what the Synod is going to address. Was there anything surprising to you as the pastor of these souls in, in Lincoln, Nebraska there that came from that? The only thing that was surprising was that uh, I think families who are really living the, the, their faith as best they can, and everybody has struggles and problems, but that they, want, they wanted the Synod Fathers to know that their marriages are happy, you know, that they're fulfilled, and that, um, that this is a way uh, to holiness and a way to uh, virtue and human flourishing. And they wanted, uh, at least uh, the majority of families that I spoke with, they wanted the Synod Fathers to know that, that there are people out there that are living the faith and trying as best they can 
to embrace the church's teaching and the fullness of the church's teaching, and, and, and they want to be heard as well. The other group, too, that wants to be heard, for example, and I was at a conference on Friday, it was sponsored by Courage, is that those who are experiencing same-sex same attraction and, and trying to live the church's teaching uh, in a heroic way, they too want to be heard. You know, they want to, they want to be heard that uh, there, there are people who embrace the church's teaching who are also experiencing same-sex attraction. And, um, and these were some wonderful people who uh, were giving witness and testimony at this conference at the Angelicum this past week, uh, sponsored by Courage. Thank you so much, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you. A great interview there with Bishop Conley, and we thank him for his time uh, for that interview for our coverage. We also like to thank our guests today, Michael Kelly of the I I Irish Catholic and Father Fawcett from the UK who joined us, who was inside last year's synod and gave us all of that insight. This concludes today's show of EWTN News' coverage of the Synod on the Family. Remember, for all the latest information on the Synod, to check out EWTN TV, radio, and our app. And for the latest programming information, check out our website at EWTN.com. And follow us on Twitter and send us your questions and comments and use the hashtag EWTN Synod. So hashtag EWTN Synod. Please send us your comments and questions. We're here live in Rome wanting to answer any of your questions and concerns. We'll be back tomorrow with our continuing Synod coverage. I'm Mary Shevlin. Good night from Rome.